Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fly Tying Monday. It's the Tom and Julia show. And I think Phil's here, too. I think Phil's in the background. Um, Phil Monahan. So we're all here and, and waiting for you. And as um, soon as I see that some people are are in the show, we'll start. Hope you have some some great questions to ask me today. I know you're all waiting for me to to break my thread or cut my thread or you know the hook to fall out of the vice or something like that. No, you know, I'll try to I'll try to help you out there and do something stupid. Warren's here from Wellington, New Zealand, and Christian and Brandon and Ken. So it looks like uh Looks like people are people are coming in. And Ed, of course, from Florida, and Larry and Bill from Carmel, Indiana. And Ralph and Mario from Naples, Italy. Wow, we've got an international international crew. Frank from Hamburg. Is that Hamburg, Illinois, or Germany? And Peter from Warsaw. Wow, we've got a real international audience today. Lots of people, lots of people coming in. So it looks like looks like we got a, a pretty good group here. So I'll start. Um, the fly today is called Schultz's Single Fly Cray. It's developed by Mike Schultz. Mike is a is a great uh, fly shop owner and guide from Michigan, and um, does a ton of big trophy smallmouth fishing. And of course, smallmouth bass are, um, are big crayfish eaters. It's one of their, probably one of their, one of their favorite in, in many places, it's their favorite food. So, um, a crayfish imitation is important. Something that, that looks like a crayfish. And, you know, people look at this fly and say, well, that doesn't look like a crayfish. It, you know, it's kind of fuzzy and somebody, Somebody made a comment that it looks like a, a dead chicken or something on the on the uh, when we uh, pre, when we showed this on the the Orbis website. But um, the idea here, and I'm I'm sure this was Mike's idea, uh, was to give the impression of a swimming crayfish, not a crayfish that's stiff and laying on the bottom. Um, give the the impression to a, a predator. Of, of a swimming fleeing crayfish. And you know, when a, when a predator fish comes near a crayfish, they're gonna scoot out of there. And if you have ever watched a crayfish swim, and I would encourage you all to, um, you know, if you, if you fish in waters where there's a lot of crayfish in the shallows, to do a little kicking around and watch how they behave because that's what you want your fly to do. And a crayfish, of course, they swim backwards with their claws streaming behind them. But when a crayfish is swimming, um, it's just kind of one long undulating uh, piece of stuff. It doesn't, you, you can't really see the claws and the antennae and everything. All you see is a, a thing scooting along that has a kind of a broad shape and, um, and the color um, of a crayfish. So, um, Dylan's asking, do you eat crayfish tail first like a bass? I'm not sure if they eat them tail first or they just grab them. Um, since crayfish are usually uh, fleeing away from a predator, Dylan, and they flee backwards, I would imagine they eat them tail first. Um, you know, trout, trout like um, trout like small crayfish, and I'm sure they just inhale them. They just they just open their mouth and suck them in, and you know, head or tail doesn't matter. Uh, they like small crayfish. So um, I wanted to tie this fly. It's it's not one that I've used, but Mike Mike uh, Mike uh, Schultz is uh, an unbelievable angler, and any fly that he develops is going to be a good crayfish imitation. So um, you know what we're what we're trying to imitate here is is the impression of a crayfish swimming, and I think it I think it does the job very well. Um, Regarding colors, because you you always ask me colors, I'm going to tie this. You know the pattern that I we posted called for tan, 
And I decided, I actually took a look at some of the photographs of crayfish I've taken in our local rivers. And they're kind of orangey, kind of brownish orange. Uh, and some of them are olive. So I decided to tie this in, a, in an orangey brown just because um, I'm going to use this fly. And so I might as well tie something I'm going to use. Um, you know, you, you'll see olive crayfish. Some of them are actually bluish colored. So they're all they're all different colors. Some of them are tan. Some of them are dark brown. But what I what I would advise you to do is to uh, look at the crayfish in your local waters and, uh, and choose the color accordingly. Doesn't mean you can't tie one in pink or blue or purple. Uh, you know, it still is still going to have the impression of a of a fleeing crayfish. And um, how how small can you tie these? Ken, I would think you could tie this down to about a you know about a size, maybe a size eight. The problem is you uh, you'd have to have a pretty thin rabbit strip to go much smaller than that. I'm tying this on a size four, which is not out of line for for either trout or bass um you know it's it's a pretty good size but but trout trout will eat pretty good size crayfish and i wanted to tie a fly that i could use both for i, I could use for small mouth for a large mouth and for trout i like i like to tie flies that i can use for multiple species uh and this one i'm gonna i'm gonna put in my my trout box early in the season and then I'm going to move it probably to my smallmouth bass box, smallmouth and largemouth. Um, largemouth bass eat crayfish too, and they love crayfish. And I can't tell you the number of times when a sinking crayfish fly has saved the day for me when fishing for largemouth bass, when they wouldn't take the standard uh, largemouth patterns, particularly if you find largemouth in, in lakes uh, where they're around some rocks. Uh, which crayfish love. Crayfish will also be in weedy areas too. They they typically live. Uh, I know from from poking around in streams around here with my son. I know that um, crayfish either live under rocks or they often live um, underneath banks, undercut banks, and they live. You know, they they sometimes. I think I believe they sometimes uh, dig holes in the bank and and live in those holes. So that's why. Sometimes a streamer cast right to the bank and scoot it out from the bank will elicit a strike. And what we're trying to do here is, is elicit a reaction strike from a trout or bass. You know, oh, there's a crayfish trying to get away. Boom, I'm going to eat it. Um, this is probably isn't something that you want to lay on the bottom and wait for something to come along and inhale it. This, this fly, you should, you should fish with some motion because it, it's imitating a, flea, a fleeing or, or a moving crayfish. And Larry, I don't know if this pattern is good for steelhead. Uh, probably. I've caught lots of steelhead on streamers. I've caught steelhead on bonefish flies before. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it could work for steelhead. Who, who knows? I don't know. I've never used it for steelhead. All right. Shall we start? Anybody tying along with me today? All right. Let's start. So I'm going to take... Uh, Take that fly out of the hook, out of the vise, and I'm going to put in a Gamagatsu uh, stinger hook, size four. I really like this hook for large trout streamers, bass flies. You know, it, you can even use this in salt water if you want. Even if I... And then I'm going to start my thread. Pattern calls for red thread. You could you could use a thread to match your body color, or you could use red, whatever. I'm going to use uh, 6O red. You could use 3O or 140 denier or 210 denier even on bigger flies. I'm just going to start my thread and just get a little base of thread up near the front. And then, how's that exposure look? Somebody said my materials were too dark last week. It looked better. Looking good better. to me. Okay. And then I'm going to take, oh, grab my eyes. I forgot my eyes. So I'm going to take some, uh, um, one of these uh, red, uh, uh, 
solid metal eyes. It could probably be any color, but the pattern calls for red, so we're gonna we're gonna use red. And I am going to cross this back a ways from the eye. Give yourself a little room to form a head there. And at first I'm going to go away from me, take a bunch of turns. Then I'm going to move the eyes so that they're centered. And I'm going to wind the other way. And you could do figure eights. You could do like this. You know, that's a figure eight. Or you could just go back and forth. Just get a whole bunch of thread on there. Nice tight turns. And then to lock these in place, you want to go around with lots of tension around the base. That's going to lock those in there. Tom, what size eyes are you using? I am using, uh, I am using 730 seconds. Okay. Thank you. You could vary these depending on, you know, how deep the water you're going to fish. You could put bigger ones on to sink it, sink it quicker. Or you could put smaller ones on if you're fishing really shallow and, or if you're fishing with a lighter rod and you don't want to cast all that weight. Uh, so you can vary, you can vary the eyes depending on how deep you want to go. You can vary the color too. If you want, you could put a drop of super glue on these eyes. But if you, if you put those thread wraps in place, um, the eyes are going to stay put. I'm going to take some rubber legs, orange. These, uh, I'm going to take some of these, oops, bump my camera. I'll take some of these uh, orange silly legs. And I don't know, I'm going to take four of them. One, two, ah, maybe I'll do five. I'll go nuts here. And I'm going to get the whole length. Cut them off. So I've got, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna use this camera, this bigger camera, for a minute here. I'm gonna I'm gonna fold the legs over the thread like so, and then I'm just going to start to wind back toward the rear and I'll switch cameras now and I'm going to wind back uh keeping them kind of on top of the hook going to go all the way back to the bend pull them towards you a little bit but they can splay all around there go all the way back and then cut them off I don't know maybe uh a hook a hook length, like so. And then I'm going to go back to the front. And when I go back to the front, I can secure those legs a little bit more. And then I'm going to take maybe, I don't know, Five strands of blue flashaboo. What a mess here. I know there's better ways of dealing with flashaboo, but I put all mine in a big box. I'm going to get like, I don't know, five strands of flash of blue flashaboo, lay them down on the table. And then the pattern calls for copper flashaboo. Well, I didn't have any copper flashaboo. I'm going to use crystal flash instead. Doesn't matter. Just some some flashy stuff, whatever you got. There's all different kinds of flashy material. And I'm going to take an equal number, roughly. I'm not going to count them. Just grab a bunch. 
cut them off, lay them down so that I've got a combination blue and copper uh, bunch of stuff here. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to fold these. And it helps to wet them. Helps keep them together. They'll, uh, they'll splay out after it dries. And I'm going to fold them over the thread. Got to get them all. That one that didn't want to behave there. That's all right. And I'm just going to lash them to the hook, switch cameras. And I'm going to wind back over them. Tom, we have a few questions. Okay, let me finish this and I'll answer questions. And then I'm going to cut those off just a little bit longer. These are kind of the antennae and the feelers and stuff. I'm just going to cut them off a little bit longer. So there you go. And I notice I got a little piece up here that I'll just get rid of. All right. Questions. All right. Uh, Derek was asking about if you were going to pinch the barb now. Mm -hmm. No, I figured. Not now. <laughs> After or he, said, he said pinching that barb question mark, I should say. Yeah, pinch bar, of course. <laughs> and then uh, Ken was asking, can you use pine squirrel strips in crawdad color? Yeah, that actually, good question, because I'm actually I'm actually going to uh what's that book look, man? I am actually gonna use pine squirrel uh, nice. instead of I should have put a drop of super glue on those eyes, they're twisting on me. And then Joe was asking what uh, size of like flash of blue do you like to use or is best to use for this? Just the standard size. Okay. You could use any size you want though. All right. That, those are all the questions. Uh, okay. JJ remarked that looks like you have a new vice and that they, they'll take the Renzetti off your hands. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, this is a, uh, this is a Renzetti. This is the basic hundred dollar Renzetti vice <laughs> that I'm using today. Um, it's the, you know, it's kind of the next, the next step up from, uh, from a, uh, from a, you know, a, a cheap uh, imported uh, vice that you get in a kit. So it's kind of the next step up. It's a really good vice. Nice. So. All right. That's all for now. Okay. So I am going to use pine squirrel for the claws in a crawdad color, kind of a brownish, brownish color. I think, it, I think they look nice. But you could use rabbit strip. You could use it, you know, mink if you have it. You could use anything. And uh, I'm going to, when you cut this stuff, just, what I'd like to do is just cut the, cut the bottom of the strip and then break it. And then you don't cut through the hair at the top. And so I've got one piece. That's a little long. Actually, I don't like that end of that. Cut that off a little bit more. And then I'm going to cut another one. Because you, they got two claws. Some crayfish have one claw, so you could even, if you wanted to, you could just put one claw on it. And then I'm going to go over and measure them, measure one of them. So I'm going to go over to the vise. And I'm going to measure one. And I want it to be not quite as long as, uh, as the, uh, the flashable, a little bit shorter. And I'm going to just mark that here. And come back 
and just cut the fur off beyond that point like so and then I'll I'll uh, line line it up with the other one and I'll cut the other one the same amount and I can see that's going to be too long I'm going to cut the leather off there so I've got two matching claws with a little bit of uh, Tom, Edward has a couple questions. Yeah. The first being, could you use a crayfish colored brush instead of rabbit for the body? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And then um, how long for the claws? Just a little bit longer than the rubber legs. A little bit longer than the rubber legs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank the you. The crayfish claws vary in size, so I don't, I don't think there's any... As long as you have the impression of claws sticking back there, I don't think you need to wig out about how long they are, you know? Okay. Um, just want the impression of something a little bit thicker at the back end. And, of course, these things wiggle really well, too. So I'm just going to put one on the far side, like so. And lash it down all the way up to the eyes and i'll come back and i'm gonna put another one you guessed it on the near side so that you got you know two things sticking back there that are gonna that are going to really wiggle and strain behind this fly. Now that's all you need to do. And then I'm going to take another piece of that same fur and I'm going to tie it in. I'm going to tweak a little bit of the fur off there. I probably should cut it. But I can't find my scissors. Where'd my scissors go? No, oh, there they are. Under the flash of blue. Oh, let's get rid of that flash of blue. I'm just going to cut a little bit here. And if you have cross-cut rabbit, this would be a good place to use it. If you don't, don't worry about it. Cross-cut, um, when you're going to wind it for a body, makes it... Uh, Makes it a little easier. So I'm going to just tie that again to the top of the shank. And then I'm just going to wind this, just kind of stroke that pine squirrel back as I wind. And only a couple turns. You want to kind of make your spirals pretty wide there. You don't want this stuff to be longer than your, uh, than your, claws. I'm just going to get that in place. Cut it off. And then I'm going to kind of stroke that back and give myself, wind back on it a little bit, give myself a little bit of a base there to tie in my mallard feather. So there you are so far. Got your claws sticking out. Got your body here. All of this is going to wiggle. All of it's going to wiggle in the water. Now I'm going to take a, the pattern calls for a dyed, uh, orange dyed mallard feather. And I like the looks of that on this. Where do you get orange dyed mallard? I have no idea had a piece here somewhere but I do have lots of white mallard where did my piece of mallard go I lost it hmm what a mess what a mess all right well I got some other ones made up I gotta walk over here and get myself some new mallard 
piece of mallard. So this is a, a mallard feather. I just colored it with, uh, get this out of the way. I just colored it with a permanent marker. So um, to get the orange color, just put it on a piece of paper and mark Tom, it up. Yeah. Um, JR has an interesting question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> He's asking, uh, any thoughts on whether all the flash between the claws could be a problem in clearer water? Or was Schultz specifically trying to imitate a crawfish trying to swallow a Christmas tree? <laughs> I don't know. I guess the, the added flash is an added attraction. <laughs> I don't know. All right. But I'm not going to argue with the pattern because Schultz knows what he's doing. So I'm going to take my uh, mallard feather, and I find it easier if you strip uh, this side of the feather off, because you're going to be you're going to be folding this, and you want it to wind back, and um, you don't want an awful lot of it. And I'm not sure exactly what this imitates. Maybe some more of the legs. Um, again, it's it's an impression we're trying to get. And I'm going to take that. Oops. Let's just uh, go back to this other camera. I'm going to take this feather and just stroke the fibers down so that I have just that tip exposed. That's the part I'm going to tie in. Like so. And then we're going to tie in that tip of that mallard feather. There are four really good tight turns. Trim off the butt. And then you're gonna just wind this mallard feather, stroke it back. And this kind of, you know, gives a modeling effect. There's a kind of a modeled effect to the fly. More movement, little contrast. Gonna keep stroking it back till I get around here. Then I'm gonna tie that off. Trim it. Bind it down a little bit more. Wind back on it a little bit so it streams back. Any that don't go where you want them, just trim them. So there you go. And then I am going to... Now the pattern calls for the uh, unmarked, not a modeled head. So I'm just going to use a standard piece of brown rabbit for the kind of matches the color on that pine squirrel, but this is actually rabbit. And I am going to find myself a nice area of full fibers or full hair there, a nice kind of a straight stretch. And well, we have a to... Bill. <laughs> Tom, Bill has a question about uh, substitutions. And is asking, would orange guinea body feather work versus the mallard? Yeah, that would work pretty well. Yeah. Right. Orange guinea body feather would be a good substitute for mallard. All right. Two I'm other gonna... questions. Okay. Ken's asking if you could tie one using golden olive color. You could tie one using any color your little heart desires. <laughs> Look at the crayfish in uh, your local waters and try to match them. Yep. And then Thomas is asking, uh, or s says, I'm curious as to why the eyes are near the, the hook eye. Shouldn't they be closer to the hook bend? Because that's the way, that's the way Mike Schultz ties it. <laughs> it must have to do with the, the action that it has in the water. Yeah, it doesn't make sense because the eyes on a crayfish, the eyes on a crayfish are at, at the rear end. Mm-hmm. 
Garrett, yeah, absolutely. But so, you know, it's the same thing with shrimp and with crabs, and we, we always tie our weight up toward, up toward the eye most of the time. Um, I, I don't, I guess, I don't know, I guess it doesn't give it as good an action. Mm. And yeah, the, it, it doesn't make sense to have eyes there. Crayfish do. Crayfish do actually. Female crayfish carry um, egg masses under their tail. Of course, this is gonna. This is gonna be. The eyes are gonna be on the bottom. Those eyes are gonna be on the bottom. They're gonna. It's gonna be inverted when you fish it. So we'll call those eyes an imitation of an egg sac. How's that? Because <laughs> the female carries eggs underneath her tail. Oh. Uh, so we're gonna call. We're gonna call that an egg sac. Okay. Great. And then um, I think I know the answer to this, but Mac is asking if you can use waterproof markers on feathers if you can't find an orange or the color. So I know that you're a big advocate. That's what I said. That's yeah. what I said. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't have any orange, so I just use a waterproof marker. Yep. All right. You want to try, try to find a waterproof marker with a broad tip and not a fine tip because otherwise you'll be marking forever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, a lot of the markers have a, a wide tip on one end and a fine tip on the other, which is probably what you want. Perfect. So, All right, so back gonna, to it. I, okay, so I'm going to take I'm going to take this fur and kind of stroke it off to the side, and then I'm going to come in with these with these neat um, hairline master clamps. You could use a binder clip, um, you know, some kind of some kind of clip. Uh, there's these are made for fly tying, or you can use just a standard old binder clip. And I'm going to get a, I'm going to, I'm going to run these in there and pinch a bunch of that. Try to get it straight. Like so. so I've got a nice bunch. And then I'm going to take a pair of long scissors. This makes it easier. And I'm going to cut this off. the skin. So now I've got a uh, length of fur in this, in these clamps or binder clip or uh, whatever, whatever else you'd like to use. I'm going to put that aside for a minute. And then I think we'll do this with the wider camera. Now I'm going to make a dubbing loop. Now people are going to ask, why, why do a dubbing loop here? Why don't you just wind another piece of rabbit fur? Well, I think the, the reason that, that Mike did it this way is that trying to wrap a piece of rawhide rabbit strip around these eyes without creating a ton of bulk is really, really difficult. Um, so I think that's why he puts this final uh, bunch of rabbit in a loop. So what I'm going to do is pull some thread off my bobbin and then I'm going to loop it around my finger and I'm going to tie it off so that I've got a loop. And then, and then I can't find my dubbing spinner. Huh. I'm looking for my dubbing spinner. I'm, boy, I've lo I'm losing everything this week. It's probably in this mess here. Oh, there it is. Of course, now I got my loop all twisted up. I gotta untwist it. All right. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna hook this in my dubbing spinner. Does that show okay? Yeah. Turn this down a little bit. And then I'm going to wax my thread. This is one place where wax does help. Put some wax on there. Nice good sticky coat of wax. And I'm going to bring, bring, I'm going to put my finger in the loop to open it up a little bit. And just bring this fur right into that spot and then close the loop down on it. Whoops, like so. And I want those, I'm going to have to pull these through. 
I didn't want it quite that long, so I'm going to pull it through a little bit. You can manipulate this as long as you don't have too much wax on your fingers. So I've got that on there. Then I'm going to pitch the loop here. I'm going to spin my spinner and then open up my fingers and let it twirl around there. And I see that it kind of got caught up here. So what I'm going to do is take my finger brush and try to brush this out a little bit up here. Just got caught in the wax. Might as well brush the whole thing while I'm at it. Okay. And then I'm going to bring my thread up in front of the eye. And I'm going to wind that head. Stroke that fur back a little bit. Take maybe one or two turns behind the eyes. And then come forward. And a couple turns in front of the eyes. And tie it off. Cut your thread. I actually left myself a little too much room there. Had a longer, longer head than uh, than I had anticipated. Kind of ran out of fur. Probably should have put another bunch of fur in there. And then you can you can brush this back with a finger brush or a comb or something. Kind of make it stream back a little bit more. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. This way, there. So again, That's great. that doesn't look much like a crayfish to us. But once this thing gets wet and it's streaming <laughs> through the water, I'm assuming it's going to look like a crayfish. We've got a couple questions once you're done, Tom, but it's so nice looking. I'm going to I'm going to pop out for a second and we can we can address them in a second. OK. All right. So that's it. Put a drop of head cement on that and. Uh, and you've got your. You've got your crayfish. And again, doesn't look like much, but this is all going to be very mobile in the water. It's going to really, really. Uh, wiggle and undulate, which is what a crayfish does when it's swimming. And I'm sure that there's probably times when fish take this for a bait fish too, you know. Um, again, it's an impression of something trying to get away. All right. That is, that is the fly. Let's answer questions. All right. We had a lot of questions about um, kind of around some of your materials and tools. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Roger Bird was asking, what is your preferred brand of markers when we were talking about marking the feathers up? Oh, um, I don't know. I just buy the cheapest waterproof markers I can find. <laughs> I do have some prism Prisma colors mm. from a long time ago, which are very good. Um, and I also use, let me just grab this one here. I also use one called Shuttle Art. Hmm. Shuttle, S-H-U-T-T-L-E. I bought it, I bought it on, I bought them online. Um, you know, as long as they're a permanent marker. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen much difference. As long as they're alcohol-based markers, I haven't seen much difference. In, okay. In them, so. And Joe was asking where you can purchase one of the clamps that you were using. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, may be available in some Orvis stores, but it's, it's a, it's made by Hairline, H-A-R-E-L-I-N-E, -E, and they don't sell direct to consumers, but if you go online and, uh, you know, someplace like Fly Fish Food, um, is a good, is a good place that has a really wide variety of tying materials. So they're a good Orvis dealer. Um, my friend Cheech, I'm sure would be happy to sell you a pair of those. 
But you can use a binder. You can use just a regular old binder clip too. You know, a metal binder oh, clip. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those are um, those are those are a little handier, but um, than a binder clip. But yeah. Use it in a pinch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and Roger was asking, Roger S. Martin Jr. was asking when using dubbing spinner, um, when using the dubbing spinner, do you go clockwise or counterclockwise? Or do you have like a, I thought that was an interesting hmm. question. I didn't know if you had, if it mattered. I don't think it matters, but I go, I go counterclockwise. I spin it counterclockwise. I don't think it matters. Okay. I, I really don't think it matters. Because I, you know, people uh, people have asked about dubbing, whether you should squeeze your dubbing and 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 run it, you know, and oh. run it clockwise or counterclockwise. And um, I did a I did a, um, a study for myself. I I took a I took a some very fine dubbing, and I dubbed it clockwise, and then I dubbed it counterclockwise, and I wound them, and I took a look under a. Uh, I took pictures of them and then enlarged the photos so to where I could see them and I Whoa. and I scratched my fingernail on them and to see if any one was more durable than the other and they seem to be the same to me so I don't think it matters. <laughs> um and then nice Ed, Edward tied along one of our one of I our see that Ed Ed work. nice going Ed and then uh, this is interesting Ralph's asking if the eyes. Are uh, oh, are the eyes the metal eyes are for the weight? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're for yeah. weight. They're yeah. for weight. Yeah. yeah, they're not they're not specifically to imitate anything. If you don't like the metal eyes, you could you could wind the shank with uh, some non toxic wire or put a cone on. Well, you couldn't really put a cone on this one, but they're really just for the weight. Yeah. Great. Those are all the questions we have at the moment, and a lot in of in lieu you know, of the rabbit and soccer strip, could you use polar oh, fiber? There we go. No, I don't think he could use uh, polar fiber. Would be a pain, John. I, I don't think. <laughs> I think that that would be, uh, yeah, because it, yeah, it's too long. I think polar fiber is too long, and you could try it, but I don't think it would work as well. Uh, Roger is asking me if this is a beef stew. Roger, you are the third person to ask me that. No, it is a humidifier for our wood stove because it gets very dry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I were making a beef stew. Uh, you know, it's about at 400 degrees now though so it would be real crisp yeah all right any uh any other questions that we have i see we finished pretty early today just wanted to know if anyone uh <laughs> have you ever been in norway fishing no i have not are the podcasts still searchable yes Thomas, they are searchable. They're not searchable on the Orvis site. I don't even think they're on the Orvis site anymore. But the, um, if you go to the Orvis Learning Center at howtoflyfish.orvis.com, all the podcasts are there and they are searchable and uh, they're all keyworded. So even if uh, even if a, a, a topic like that's in the fly box is, um, is not in the title of the podcast, there are some keywords behind there. So... Uh, that's the best place to, to search the podcast. Yeah. And thank you for putting the link on there, whether that was Phil or Julia. Thank you. But that's the only place they're searchable. You can't search them on Spotify and our iTunes and, or on the Orvis site. Ed used a tarantula brush in crayfish color and it came out good. Oh, great, Ed. Good, good, good use of a substitute. Very cool. And Nick, uh, Arctic Fox, uh, Arctic, Arctic Fox would be tough to make the body out of, I guess. No, yeah, they, they sell Arctic Fox zonkers. Yeah, for a bigger, for a, I think for a bigger crayfish, you could use Arctic Fox zonker. Yeah. If you got it in the right color. Mm -hmm. Warren says, in New Zealand, freshwater cray are dark in color, deep, dark, gray, black color. Huh, interesting. And I assume they're probably invasive there, Warren. Um, I don't think you have native crayfish, right? I know that in South America, they don't have crayfish, but they have a, 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 
crustacean called a pancora, which is uh, looks like a little crab. Um, it looks more it's more crab like than a uh, than a crayfish, but it's very similar. And fish uh, fish love those too, and they're they're a very much a, a dark olive color, the pancora. When will the super fine carbon come back? Uh, I don't know, Stefan. I don't know. Um, there a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the lighter line recon and helios rods are quite close to the super fine action. They're a they're a, a more um, intermediate action. They're made with intermediate modulus. So we kind of rolled the super fine rods into the into the standard ones. Schiltze as in Mike Shields from Michigan. Yes, Matt. Mike Shields from Michigan. Southern Utah, says David. Crawdad changed colors throughout the season. Good to tie this pattern in multiple colors. Yeah, and I think after they molt, they're a different color too. So um, yeah, it would be uh, it would be a good idea to uh, to tie them in multiple colors because you never know what colors they're going to be or what colors the fish like. You know, the fish might like a color that's opposite what they're used to seeing. Maybe it'd be more visible in a certain water type or something. Uh, our next tie off is next Wednesday, so we don't have. We don't have fly tying on uh, Valentine's Day, right, Julia? We're, we're moving to Wednesday to accommodate uh, Tim Flagler's schedule, and we're tying the CDC and elk. So the tie-off next week will be on Wednesday and not, uh, not on Monday. Any other questions or comments? What would be the best way to fish? Small uh, strips. Yeah, I would, Ralph, I would, I would fish it in um, maybe like eight inch strips and then pause just briefly. Um, I wouldn't pause too much because again, this is supposed to imitate a swimming crayfish and uh, you can let it sink a little bit in between, but um, you, you know, this, this is not a realistic crayfish imitation. You don't want the fish to get too good a look at it. So you want to keep it moving. Ken, we are tying the uh, CDC and elk uh, caddis dry fly, one of Tim's favorites, next, next uh, Wednesday. Fairly fairly simple fly, but not easy. And I sh I'm sure since it's one of Tim's favorites, he's going to whip my butt, but that's okay. They are native. Oh, Ward says they're native, three to four inches in length. Cool. I'm sure. They, I'm sure they're smaller too when they're when they're first hatched. Um, I know that uh, trout in the states love those little tiny crayfish that are you know no bigger than a stonefly nymph. Um, they love to eat those when they're first hatched. Adding a rattle is a good idea on this fly. If you want to put one of those clunky, stupid rattles on this fly, Brian, you go right ahead. I don't like rattles um, because uh, they're big and they're and they're really, really bulky. Um, you know, if you want if you want to put put a rattle on this, you know, you might try the technique that I used on the Grand Slam crab. Uh, it's in the it's in the YouTube archives from uh, maybe three four weeks ago. Uh, where you where you tie a bunch of tungsten beads on a piece of monofilament that might actually be pretty good on this fly, um, and you can get that you they'll click together. the The beads are hung from a piece of monofilament, and they'll click together when you strip it. But as far as putting one of those glass rattles on here, boy, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't. They're just too big. They're just too bulky. Uh, Mike, yes, the Orvis, the Orvis web, uh, Orvis is not abandoning the UK. Orvis is, is, uh, is going to be, uh, fully involved in the UK fishing business. Um, that's, that's not going away. So it's, uh, Orvis, Orvis fishing tackle is going to be available in the UK and, um, uh, on the website. So yeah, we're not abandoning the UK in the fishing fishing market. 
Tips for casting heavier flies like this. Can't seem to get the distance I'm used to. With, yeah. Um, Stephen, they are harder to cast. Uh, I would recommend uh, making sure you cast a more open loop. And also I would use the Belgian cast on a big heavy fly like this. If you don't know the Belgian cast, go to the Orvis Learning Center. Uh, there's, a great, uh, there's a great demonstration of Pete uh, Kutzer, our casting guru, uh, demonstrating the Belgian cast. Uh, don't use a lot of false casts. Just try to pick it up and lob it back out there. Um, you know, that that the doesn't cast as well as a nice dry fly or wet. Yeah, um, you have to kind of lob it. And, um, you know, if you're having trouble, um, somebody gave me a great tip on the podcast last week, a podcast question. Go out and practice. Uh, put a piece of yarn on the end of your leader as you normally would. And then put a split shot or two on there and practice your casting with a split shot uh, on your leader so that you get used to the having the weight uh, of that of that bigger fly. And, uh, you know, use the Belgian cast and a nice open loop. And again, don't do a lot of false casting. Have you fished in Georgia? A couple times, Tommy. A couple times couple times for bass, a couple times for trout in the Chattahoochee. Not a lot. I haven't fished a lot in Georgia. False cast equals head smacks. Yes, Thomas, I totally agree with you. <laughs> or rod smacks. I don't know which is worse, breaking your rod or hitting yourself in the head with a lead eye or a metal eyed fly. But uh, yeah. Is a hot dog a sandwich? That's a good question. I'd consider it a sandwich. That's an unusual question. <laughs> All right. Any other questions that have to do with fishing or fly tying? Ed said, I use a piece of pipe cleaner with a split shot for practicing the Belgian cast. Great idea, Ed. Great idea. Yep. That'll simulate the, the weight and the bulk of a, of a bigger fly like this. Great, great idea. All right, everyone. Well, unless we have any any other serious questions today, uh, thank you for tuning in. We we love doing these. We have fun. Uh, there were some great questions today, as usual, and um, appreciate you coming on. It means a lot to us that you you know, hundred and fifty or two hundred of you uh, spent part of your afternoon with us. So. Um, we like that. And we'll keep doing it as long as you keep tuning in. So um, thanks to me. Thanks for me and Julia and Phil for tuning in today. And uh, we will see you soon. <laughs>